is definitely stretching me. That's the first time in my life I've preached two messages in a day. And they're both different, so I had to go and preach to another friend of mine just like two hours ago. And Lord laid on my heart on a different message. And I was, okay, Lord, you're definitely stretching me. And anyway, um, I've, I've um, preached this message before, or just to the men's group, um, to part of it anyway. So, but let's, let's ask the Lord to bless. Let me just have a prayer first. That's okay. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so thankful that the blood of Jesus covers all our sins. We do pray, Lord God, that you be with us um, this night, Lord God, and, and speak to us through your word. Lord, you are stretching me. Lord God, please, I ask for help. Lord, may your spirit move amongst us. Lord, just strengthen the brethren, please, I pray, Lord, today. Lord, help us to have a, a sole purpose, Lord, for you, Lord God. A soul consciousness, Lord God. Help us as a church, Lord, to do things according to your will and your way. And Lord, just be with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you open to with me in the book of Romans, Romans um, chapter 9, um, we read first to the third verse. And the title probably of the message would be The Passion of Souls, Passion for the Souls. So chapter 9, verse 1 to 3 would read, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed. From Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. See, Paul here had a great heaviness and continued sorrow in his heart for his brethren, for his people. Now, uh, this week, I asked my brother permission to give this illustration because I was, I was speaking to him. My, bro my brother is not a believer, um, and he said, You know, life. Life is kind of like a projector. You know, it, it just projects, you know, to the screen and, and, um, and we're all kind of looking at it. But soon enough we realize, that was his words, that there's no one in a projector room. And I said, well, in, in your worldview, it's kind of correct. Because if you think of a non-believer's point of view, you yourself is in there. You are the only one who's looking through that screen, looking through that vision, and you're looking how kind of that life works. So I posed him kind of the four questions that I read in Ravi Zacharias' book about that every worldview has to answer four questions. One would be where we come from, what is our purpose in life, then thirdly, where the morals come from? And fourthly, where are we going? So when he answered to all these four questions, obviously, well, he told me that he's, you know, from the monkeys. And I said, well, really, like, we, you believe that you came from nothing? He said, no, no, not from monkeys. He said, that, well, let's look a bit further what the evolution teaches you. It's really from nothing to something, right? Then if we look at the second, which would be the purpose he said, well, probably, he said, well, it's just to be happy, right? So just, just the general <laughs> happiness of life. The third one, the, the non-believer probably draws from, you know, either some, some morals from this book or, or just, you know, borrows from philosophy and other things. And fourth one, they just believe that they go into dirt, nitrogen or whatever is in on the ground. But, but I said to him, but for us... It's a completely different story. Now, if I say to you, where I come from, I said, well, I come from God. I'm a, creating, I'm a created creature. And secondly, I have a purpose. I have a wonderful purpose in life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just, 
I aim aimlessly and trying to seek for some sort of a, you know, happiness, which is kind of relative anyway, there is a purpose for every Christian man, woman, child. There is a purpose. God has given us a purpose. Now, God has given us the morals through the person of Jesus Christ, through, you know, Ten Commandments. They're there. And where are we going? There's, there's really two places we know that the Bible says where we're going. It's, you know, either heaven or hell. So there's, there's drastically different worldviews that people face every day. We might see the same picture, but up here, there's a completely different way how we view it. And that's where every man and every woman, will, how they live their life, they subconsciously will make decisions what they do. Now, I would say for us as Christians, the, the battle's on. That, that's the battleground. Because the devil is really after every mind. Every mind. Now, the Bible's very clear. He says, you know, devil has blinded the minds of the lost. There's a blindness net. So when we know that, when we walk out through these doors, there is a battle. There is a battle between good and evil. There is a battle between God and Satan. But ultimately, there is a battle for the souls. As we are the gospel, as we walk out of here, we might be the only representative of Christ, what people see. So the, the battle is on every day. There is a battle. Battle for salvation. And you know... Jesus has promised to us that he, he will return. And I truly believe that the long suffering of, of God is till that last person that he wants to be saved before he returns. You know, there'll be one person just before he'll return will be saved. Yes, there will be different ways, you know, how they you know, get to heaven when there's through the tribulation and through the um, you know, other dispensations. But I truly believe God's heart today is still souls. It's still souls. Now, I want to look at the two words we do together today. One is a soul. What is a soul? Soul is the real you. The real you. Let's look at Genesis 2.7. When God created the soul and breathed, breathed into a soul. says in 2.7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Man is a living soul. Every man, every child is alive. We can't deny that. But are they spiritually alive? That is the question for us. Now if you look at Matthew 1627, Matthew 1627, we see that God has put a great price on the soul, a great price, Matthew 1627. Even if we start reading before 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now verse 27, 6 now, sorry. For what is a man, what is man profited, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give exchange for his soul? God is saying here very clearly that every soul has a great value. I mean, what can we give for the soul? What can we give? Can we give a car or a house? or What, what can you give? God has passion for souls. I mean, a beautiful verse is John 3.16. John 3.16. And everyone here knows this verse. What, what do we say together? For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's beautiful. God himself has a passion and has a heart for souls. Jesus had passion for souls. His eyes were fixed to that cross all the way since his birth. He knew that he was, he, was, he was destined, he was determined to go to the cross. Apostles had a passion for souls. They went around after preaching to every man. Now, four things. Is any trip too long if the soul is one? Is any trip too long? Is any expense too great if a soul is one? Is any suffering too intense if a soul is one? Is any sacrifice too great if the soul is one? Can man give anything for the soul? Passion for souls. Passion for souls. What is our aim? Salvation of souls. That is our aim. What does a passion mean? That's the second word. What does a passion mean? Passion means suffering. Co-passion means to suffer with someone. Suffer with. But the passion is not only desire. It's not just a desire. Passion is, is something greater than that. Passion is a true devotion of life that will endure suffering. Did you catch that? Devotion for life that will endure suffering. It's a suffering love. Do you think of anyone who did that? Jesus. What about Paul? Great suffering. These guys endured such great sufferings. But they kept to the course. They knew where they're going. They knew exactly what they're in for. Passion of Christ. He had a single passion in mind. To go to the cross and suffer and shed His blood for the whole world. He did it for all of us. I mean, do you remember the time... Do you remember the time when you got saved? I mean, when I got saved, you know what? I didn't know any doctrine, I'll be honest with you. Nothing. I just went out. Well, not out. I went next. I was like, what happened? I went to work. And all of a sudden, I tell, started telling everyone what happened to me. You know what happened? Oh, I'm a new creature now. I don't want to drink. I don't want to do these things anymore. Oh, have, have, you, have you heard about Jesus? And everyone's like, oh, man, that guy again. You know what I mean? Like, they're like that. But, I mean, we're all, if you're truly born again, everyone had that experience. What happened now? I mean, since that, what I, what I found was after the first year and second year and, and everything, it's kind of like it becomes a bit of a work. And you have to go back to the passion. You have to go back to that, the first love. The first time when we just, Lord, I just love you so much. I do it, you know. Or looking back, it just brings a smile to my face. It's just the joy of the Lord of salvation. You know, like it just, it's just this joyous time. Passion for souls. Single passion. We need a single passion. I mean, I, I think we can all think of someone in our mind who had a single passion in life. And okay, Christianity, one thing, but other things in life who devoted their life for one cause. What would that be for you? What would that one cause be? If you could choose in your life, and we're all Christians here, what would it be? What would that be? Now, sometimes, I'm afraid I'm like that too. I try to kind of, you know, be like the, the, the shotgun guy. You know, just trying to just do as much as I can and kind of just, you know, aim for everything. 
You know, I have a pocket knife. You know, one of those army pocket knives that do a million things, but really they're not helping you at all. It's kind of like that. There's no, there's no singleness of vision there. You know, I'm happy just to have a knife and use it for one purpose or a screwdriver or, you know, apply whatever it gives you, scissors or something. I have one at home, you know, but I never use it. I never use it. But if I go to a garage and get a knife, yep, or whatever I need. It's kind of like that. We need, we need a single passion. We need a single passion. We need single-mindedness, for, and for not just for a short time, we need it for a lifetime. See, Christians, when they, they walk through their life and have single passion, they, they have the passion that they started with, they had the purpose, what God has laid on their heart when they started. They do great things. They do great things. You know, think of Billy Graham. We don't agree maybe everything what he t- taught, but we can look back at his life going, well, that man had a single passion. That man truly was preaching the gospel all his life. He had a single passion. He had a single passion. Now, what about Jesus? Let's look at Matthew 6, 22. What is our single passion? We really need to keep off the detours. There's too many detours. Matthew 6.22 The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Jesus saying, be a one-eyed man. Be a one-eyed man. Have a single passion. James warns us in James 1.8 he warns us against double mindedness. James 1 8. You know, there's a story told of a mule, and he was standing between the two, he was standing between the two haystacks, delicious haystacks, and he couldn't make up his mind which way to go, and he died in the middle of the two. You know, that, that's, what, that's what it's kind of like. You know, if we, if we are double-minded... I can't find James now. Yeah. Hebrews here, James 8. Not as fast as pastor, that's for sure. And James 1, 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He says there before, let, let not man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We can't be double-minded. We need to be single-focused. We need to be single-focused. Have a single passion. Jesus had a single passion to seek and to save those who were lost. Now, Satan repeatedly wanted to get Jesus off the track. Is that right? Numerous times, Jesus went on his, even when he started his ministry, straight off the bat, he went to the wilderness. What happened? He got tempted straight away of the devil. Every time he responded to the devil, it has been written. It has been written, has been written. Now, we need to be like that. We need to look at the scriptures and go, okay, are we detouring here? Are we detouring? What about when Peter came to Jesus? When, when Jesus said to him, you know, I'm going to go to cross. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't detouring. He wasn't getting off the track. Even on the cross... Even on the cross, the devil was there. He wanted to get him off the cross, you know, with the thief next to him. Why don't you get yourself and us down from here, if you truly are the Son of God? Tempting him. Jesus had a single passion. He had a single passion. 
Lord, with single passion, remained on a cross. His humanity wanted to come down, but the divinity remained. Paul had a single passion. Paul had a passion for souls. Doesn't matter where he went. People knew him for one thing of his preaching. Preaching the gospel. Preaching the good news. If you look at his letters, you know, oftentimes in the beginning, is, is stated what, what his calling is. What's he doing? You know, all the time. In Philippians, Philippians 3.13, let's look at Paul's single passion. Philippians 3.13 Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He was just pressing towards the mark. He was pressing towards the mark. That was his single passion. He was going for it. There is nothing more powerful than a single passion for life. Now, talking about detours again, there's a famous painter called Vincent van Gogh. Now, at the age of 24, he had a passion for evangelism. He went to the evangelistic school for a year. He went and preached after that for, for one year. And after that, we don't know what happened, but he went away from it. He went away from it. Now, by the age of 37, Sorry, a few years before, he started painting. He started painting. He did like 200 paintings in two years or something. Amazing. Amazing. They all, every, if you say that name, everybody would know, her, know him about the paintings. No one talks about his preaching. No one talks about his evangelism. But at the age of 37, he killed himself. He took his own life. He, bought, he went and borrowed a gun and shot himself. What a, what a drastic life. Confused. He was confused. That's why we need to have a single passion. Apostle Paul stirred up Timothy. Timothy, stir up the gift of God within you. Stir it up. Stir it up. Timothy, resist the double-mindedness. Resist it. Fight the good fight of faith. Rekindle the flame. Why don't we all ask God to give us a single passion? A single passion. What about our heart passions? What are our heart passions? What do we long for every day? Is your heart broken for the things that breaks God's heart for? Is your heart broken for the things that breaks God's heart? God's heart. Too many times we follow the things of this world and, and our hearts are not broken for the things that God... When Jesus looked upon the multitude, He had compassion. His heart was broken for them. Broken. He was weeping for them. The very verse that we read before about Paul in Romans 9, same thing. He was broken for His people. How many times you see in the Bible again and again and again Abraham, crying for Sodom, where the lots there. What about Moses? When he came down, he came down from the mountain. What did he do? He saw his, his people doing all sorts of things, worshipping idols. What did he do? He prayed for them. He said, Lord, pluck me out of the book. That is a hard passion. Can we pray like that? Imagine praying for people that is on your life now that you are praying for right now. And I'm sure there's people in your life that you're praying for right now. And you're begging for their souls. But you, are you begging like that? Are you, are you begging in a way that they're begging? Lord, take my life if they're going to be saved. That's a hard passion. That is not just saying, you know, thank you, Lord, for the food. That is connected. That is, that is your heart connected with God's heart. That is not a light prayer. 
You've got to be thinking of those things. That is a hard passion. Single passion and a hard passion. That is something else. It's something else. When Jesus, I said that before, when Jesus looked upon a multitude, he had compassion. Now, D.L. Moody had a hard passion for the souls. He had this principle that he had to tell one person a day about the Lord. So the funny story goes, one night is a very late night and he's in Chicago and he said, oh, I haven't told anyone about the Lord today. I've got to go off the street. So he runs off the street, onto the street and goes, stops a man and said, sir, do you know the Lord? And the other guy turns around and said, excuse me, sir, that is none of your business. He said, well, excuse me, that is my business. And he told him about the Lord. He was a bold man, but he had a single passion. He had a hard passion. He had determination what he will do, and he'll, he did it. He did it. Because his heart was connected to the Lord's heart. That's us. That's us today. Single passion and heart's passion for the Lord. Now quickly, four things, and I'll close. We need to burn out for God. Seek a passion for souls. Seek a passion. How are you seeking a passion for souls right now? How are you developing that love towards the lost? How are you doing it? How are you doing it? Number two, prayer is the, is the passion. Pray for them, like we said before. But truly, I, I believe that the prayer is the passion. If I tell you what you're praying for, that I, I can really tell what you're passionate about. What is your passion? Let's look at Philippians. I think we're in Philippians here now. Philippians 1.9 And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment. And this I pray, that your love may abound. That's a good prayer. In Romans 5, 5, if we turn there, allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. I don't know about you, but I have a Holy Spirit pricking in me sometimes and I resist Him. And you know, it's kind of like a feeling that, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Not, not that I know that he's, I'm not His son anymore, but it's kind of like, Oh, Lord, I know you told me to do this, but I'll let you down. I'll let you down. I, I know I should have done that. I know that was the right person to tell about the Lord, and I should have just been bold and I just said it. I, I know what I need to do, but I didn't do it. I know, but you, I do that. I do that. But you know, that's what I, we need to pray. Pray more earnestly and be bold and be obedient to the Scriptures. Be obedient. Romans 5.5 5, And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We have the Holy Ghost. We have God within us, guys. That's amazing. That is amazing. And lastly, visit the cross often. Visit the cross often. Like we said, remember when you got saved. Remember that person who told you about Christ. Remember it. Preach the gospel to yourself. You know, yesterday I was doing a study and I, you know, I came across that same verse that we talked about this morning in, in 2 Peter 1. And how in that beautiful passage, how Peter talks about, you know, when he was in ascension, well, when he was in man's transfiguration. And I read that, I, I, I kind of never realized that. But then I thought, can you imagine Peter there, you know, going there with the Lord, you know, Lord's praying, his countenance starts to change into his glory, in, into his full light. You know, I started to think about, you know, John and when he talks about that God is light and how, how Jesus is light and 
how he manifested his glory. So Peter's there, he's, he's seeing God's glory. You know, technically he saw, you know, the, the, the millennium kingdom. He, he saw that and then he heard the Father speaking from heaven down. So he's there, he's seen that. I thought, and then the guy was in Pentecost and received the Holy Spirit. I was like, wow, what manifestation of God this man would have seen. But this just, ma- this just resonated with me and I kind of preached it to myself and it got me so excited. You know, looking, looking to God and looking to Jesus and looking to those things that He has done. You know, the, all the earthly things kind of start to fade away. You don't, don't think about them anymore. You know, it's kind of like you're looking into the light and you want to keep going towards it. You know, it's kind of like that song, you know, we sing, you know, Be Thou My Vision. You know, we sang it last Sunday, last Sunday night. Is, is Jesus truly our vision? Are we, looking, are we looking to the cross? Are we looking to His light? Are we, are we looking at Jesus? Like, where are we looking? We're looking all other places. But are we really looking at Him? Is He our vision? Preach to yourself. Preach cross to yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. Preach how God took Himself. Imagine what Jesus did for us. A King of kings and Lord of lords took Himself and put Himself in a manger. Man, He humbled Himself. A greatest... Like he couldn't come as a general. He could have come whoever, but he humbled himself. Look how much he's done for you. The thorns in his head and, you know, the nail-pierced hands and hanging on a cross. And, you know, we can keep naming the things, you know, what he's done for us. It's, It's just, it blows my mind what he's done for me. And then I say, well, Lord, I'm your son and I'm adopted to your family and I can know for sure that I'm going to heaven and, you know, you're, you're kind of preaching to yourself and thinking, wow, wow, Lord, you're so good. You're so good to me. You know, all these worldly things kind of start to just, just fall away. Because you're looking to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Look on Him. And I bet when you do that, when you seek the passion for souls when you pray for passion for souls, when you seek the Holy Spirit to work through you, and you visit the cross often on those things, I'll tell you what, I can guarantee you, you won't have a problem to telling other people about it. That light will not stop. You will keep shining. It will shine through you. It will shine out of you. It will just come. You don't have to pressure it. It will be natural. But if we've got to be close to Him, preach the gospel to yourself. May Jesus be our vision. Neville, you got a song? I don't know, maybe after, you know, you sing a song, we'll just take a few minutes, just pray. Yep. God bless you guys.